Hello, uh, my name is Charles Rooks, a former Marine or Devil Dog to those within the family. And I have the distinct uh, pleasure on the wake, in the wake of uh, upcoming uh, Veterans Day to be sitting here with uh, three friends of mine who are also in their own right very distinguished uh, servants of our country, having served in the military during uh, the Vietnam War in country. And I'd like to ask uh, Thomas Belton, Milton Jones, and Gene Bryce individually to introduce themselves and, and answer the question, where did you serve and why did you serve? Tom, we'll open up with you. My name is Thomas Belton. I was born and raised in Springfield. And why did I serve? Where did you serve? Where did I serve? I mm -hmm. uh, served in I Corps in places like Da Nang and Chu Lai. And, and, and why did you serve in, uh, during my, the Vietnam time? I had an older brother by the name of Earl Purnell Belton, but commonly known as Duke Belton, and he was a Marine. And when I was a little boy, he was my idol, and I couldn't wait to get old enough to join the Marine Corps to be like my brother. Uh, Milton? Uh, my name is Milton Jones. Uh, <clears throat> I am a Springfield native. Um, I uh, am a member of the United States Air Force, and I uh, chose to join the Air Force in the Vietnam War uh, because I was really conflicted with uh, wanting to support the Vietnam War, but at the same time, I wanted to fulfill my obligation uh, to my country in terms of my military duty. So rather than wait to get drafted, I went ahead and joined the Air Force. Uh, I was stateside the majority of the time. I was stationed at Langley Air Force Base, uh, but I did have some temporary duty uh, stations in uh, Mildenhall, England, as well as Rhein-Main, Germany. My name is Gene Bryce, and uh, I was born in Florida, Cocoa Beach, and my family moved here in 1956. And um, I went to local schools, but when I got out of school, I, I realized that I wasn't going on to college. Mm -hmm. And there was, there, was, there was an alternative for me to either join the military or stay on the corner. So I chose to join the military. And that was in 1967. I did my basic training at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and my, my, my um, skill training at, at the same place. And then I had orders to go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I served in Vietnam with the 9th Infantry Division for six months. And then I served with the Big Red One for, for, the other, for another six months. And we were, I, I was pretty much stationed uh, down in the Mekong Delta, uh, in a place called um, Binfu, um, Dong Tam, and Bearcat. Those were some of our ma major bases. Um, I, was, I was an infantry soldier, and um, glad to be back home. Mm -hmm. um, why, uh, what was the other question? Why, why, why did you? Why did, did you I serve? I wanted to get away. I had been doing nothing and I, want, I just want to get away mm -hmm. and, and experience, experience mm -hmm. the world. Knowing that my, um, now I, I knew that all along, mm -hmm. and, I, I, and I didn't mind going, and I, and I signed up for the infantry. Mm -hmm. And um, I did 28 years in the military. Mm -hmm. So um, I took that opportunity and made a career out of it. Mm -hmm. When I was 27 years old, mm -hmm. I was the youngest first sergeant in, in the entire army, mm -hmm. and, as, as a black soldier. Mm -hmm. And that was big time. I went, I, went to, I went to first sergeant school at 27, unheard of. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the, all, all the old white sergeants was there saying, what are you doing here, boy? And that's what they were called, what are you doing here, boy? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I never let it bother me. Mm -hmm. I never let, because I knew what I was doing, and I knew mm -hmm. I was, I was, I, I was, I was I'll make a good first sergeant. Mm -hmm. I went back to my unit, and my soldiers loved me. Mm -hmm. And I loved my soldiers, and I took care of them. Mm -hmm. And I became a very good first sergeant at the age of 27. Mm -hmm. And when I got 30, they took me, they, they, 31, they pulled me off the first sergeant uh, role and made me, made me an administrator. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'm going to do this in the administrator. So I, I fought to go back as a first sergeant. Mm -hmm. I mean, from, from, from a desk to the field again. Right. I didn't want to be in the desk. I wanted to be back in the field with the fellas. Mm -hmm. And that's where I, I ended my career, back in the field. Mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, ask a follow-up question with each of you uh, from the perspective of uh, probing a little bit more of what some of your experiences were in, in Vietnam and, and what barriers did you see that were, that were broken down during that, during that period? Who, who'd like to start? 
Well, I've never been slow on the trigger, so uh -huh. um, I was stationed in El Toro, California. Uh -huh. I was with an aviation squadron. Now, now, what year was this? Time this when was you were... 1967. Okay. And I was with a squadron called VMFA 334. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting that out of probably 235, 250 people in the squadron, there were like about five people of color. Mm -hmm. And it was real obvious from when I went to Paris Island to when I got to my squadron that most people of color were earmarked for infantry. Mm -hmm. When I got to the wing, I had some experiences that uh, said something isn't right because during that time frame, there were several murders of black veterans at Camp Lejeune and Kanoe Bay. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of racial unrest in the military mm -hmm. at that time. And I can remember being in the military at El Toro, and we used to go to Los Angeles to hear people like Elridge Cleaver, H. Rap Brown, Stokey Carmichael, Bobby Seals, Huey Newton, uh, Ron Karinga talk about social unrest and issues. Mm -hmm. And the, the base that I was at didn't like for veterans of color to go to this Library of Black Congress. Mm -hmm. And there were certain things that happened on the base that they expedited people of color going overseas. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to go with your squadron. But when they had a lot of social unrest, there were people of color that were detached from their squadron mm -hmm. and sent with different squadrons. Mm -hmm. uh, in my particular case, I was able to stay with my squadron, and I left for Vietnam August of 68 mm -hmm. with 18 F-4J Phantoms that I was a plane captain for. Mm -hmm. Milton? Yeah, I can talk a little bit. Uh, my experience was a little more vicarious in terms of uh, where I was stationed at Langley Air Force Base. Uh, Langley was a command center, um, and so there was a lot of transition uh, coming through Langley, and a lot of the brothers were coming from Vietnam, stationed at Langley either temporarily or permanently, and so there was a lot of buzz about what was going on in Vietnam. Uh, at the ground level, uh, which I think was different than what civilians were uh, hearing and uh, uh, talking about. But one of the things that came through for me, I guess, was the level of solidarity uh, among uh, African American uh, soldiers, airmen, uh, corpsmen, whoever they were uh, in the Air Force, Marines, uh, that were in Vietnam. I remember uh, you know, some symbols like um, uh, the brothers used to come back and they would use shoelaces to make these mm -hmm. sort of wristbands and uh, hand ornaments that were really neatly done. Uh, but boot shoelaces, you saw those? Absolutely. Um, and the other thing that I remember is that uh, that was the first time I was introduced to the DAP. And I don't know if you guys remember what the DAP is, but it was an elaborate handshake mm -hmm. uh, that uh, got started in Vietnam. And I know it ran right through Langley Air Force Base because we sort of shared in that solidarity. Um, <clears throat> but beyond that, uh, that was, you know, some of my experience in terms of uh, what I understood about what was happening there. Okay. Gene, uh, I'll, I'll come to back to you. I just want to probe a question with, with Tom and Milton. Uh, what was your experiences with, uh, with black pilots? If, if well, I had a very unique experience. Uh, I was stationed uh, in Chulai, and Lieutenant Colonel Peterson, mm -hmm. who was the commanding officer for uh, the Black Knights 314, I had an opportunity to be in his squadron 
for a while because mm. they were short people and I went temporary assigned duty to his squadron and it was interesting because it was at that time frame that we were talking about DAP and the Black Power Salute mm -hmm. and uh, they came out with an all marine act that talked about you're not supposed to give black power in lieu of a salute and I can remember distinctly I had to catch myself because I had been sending them out on missions mm -hmm. as a plane captain and I would throw that black power salute but then when they came out with this new order they said you can't use the black power salute in lieu of a normal military salute I had to open up that hand and put that put that put that salute out there the man deserved it uh, <coughs> I've seen him since I have come out of the Marine Corps because he goes to the Montford Point Marine Association in August of each year and uh, he wrote a book, I think it's The Silver Eagles. And my experience with him as a pilot was that pilots really didn't know who was supporting them to keep them up in the air. They knew they were flying the planes. Lieutenant Colonel Peterson, he knew who was working on his birds. Mm -hmm. Some of these pilots just got in there and like, Drove it like it was a car, and he went on to become the first black, the first black man uh, who was selected for general in the Marine. That's right? right. But I would be remiss if I didn't talk about a black pilot that was a childhood friend that grew up in Springfield. His name is Robert Lee Hodge, mm -hmm. and I ran into him in Vietnam. He wasn't a Marine; he was in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. But when we were little kids in the dirt, he would always take two sticks and make a cross out of them and run around the yard and say he was going to fly planes. Mm -hmm. And he was a childhood mate that was a pilot that I ran into in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And when they came looking for me in Da Nang, they were wondering, Belton, what did you do? There's a <laughs> lieutenant out there looking for you. But his name was Robert L. Hodge, mm -hmm. and he lives in Aurora, Colorado. He flew for United for a number of years, was one of the few first black pilots that flew for United, and I had totally forgot about him. Mm -hmm. I was in a C-130 mobility outfit, um, so I was actually on planes quite a bit. Uh, but the person that stands out for me uh, was a gentleman uh, whose name was uh, Senior Master Sergeant Kesey, and he was a senior load master. He was also our first sergeant. This man was sharp on top of his job um, and uh, did everything he could to try to keep us all straight because we were wearing afros and throwing up our fists <laughs> and everything else and he was he was trying to tell us you know keep them shoes shine keep them fatigues pressed and so forth but he was uh, he was a very impressive man my experiences in Vietnam was really was really shocking to me when I got there mm -hmm. um, as, I, as I got my orders to, to, to be deployed to my home base which was down in, in, in uh, Dong Tam. I, I, I was in Benoit, and I went to Dong Tam. When I got to Dong Tam, I thought it was like going to CC, Chocolate City, mm -hmm. um, out of a, um, a division with 14,000 soldiers. I could, I could fairly say there was 9,000 people of colors in, the, mm -hmm. in, that, in that division. And we weren't treated the best. Mm -hmm. we, we, had, we, had, we had a lot of white officers. Mm -hmm. um, but what stuck to me the, the um, camaraderie ship that we developed mm -hmm. as, black, as black soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, we had a, we, we, I, was a t I was assigned to a tank scout outfit. Mm -hmm. And whenever we was rolling down the road, if we seen other brothers rolling the, the opposite way, mm -hmm. we would always give them the, the dap. We would always mm -hmm. give them the, 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 the power sign. Now, what, what year was this when you were in country? Oh, 68. Okay. 68, 69. Mm -hmm. we, we would always show each other respect and unity mm -hmm. by raising the hand. And it became a thing for us to do that. Mm -hmm. And here again, a lot of the officers didn't like that. Mm -hmm. Cause they, mm -hmm. Because one of the things that we found that when the, the, the riots was going on back in the country here, the Viet, the Viet Cong would get the Time magazines. Mm -hmm. And they would tear the pictures out of the magazine. This is not the truth. Mm -hmm. 
and you could be walking on patrol, and you could see pictures of the Time magazine where the police is actually dragging brothers and sisters through the streets of, of Detroit, mm -hmm. um, Los Angeles. I mean, they, they would post the riot stuff all over the place, mm -hmm. or they would drop leaflets for on it. They, they, would, they, would, they would, just, it was all about the riots that was going on in, in the country. And their word would be, your battle is back home. Mm -hmm. Why are you here? Mm -hmm. And we had, to think, we had to stop and think about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can remember when Martin Luther King got killed. Uh, we were on a patrol. We were, we were on, on a mission, and all the brothers laid their weapons down. Mm -hmm. They said, no more. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we had a, um, I, I had a black major who says, we can't do this, fellas. Mm -hmm. We cannot do this. We're in a war. So I know how you feel. And he kind of led us back to a reality. Mm -hmm. He says, because you've got to go on the patrol. Mm -hmm. You're going you're gonna to do what you've got to do. So pick up the weapons, and let's continue the mission. I do know how you feel. And, and I think he was one of the persons that kind of stuck to me. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, he's got a point there. We, we, can, we can only do better if we get out of here and go back, go back home and help mm -hmm. make, and try and change things. Um, that was one of the shocking things to me. Mm -hmm. But and, and all told, it, made, it made me grow up. Mm -hmm. And at the age of 19, I was leading troops on a patrol on the, on the, on the Cambodian border. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was actually leading troops on patrol. Mm -hmm. And at age 19, and I'm talking about, you know, 10, 12 guys in back of me, and they're listening to me saying what to do. Mm -hmm. With Tom and Milton, uh, probes, probe Gene's uh, point a little bit further because not only was, was there racial tension here in the, in the country during that time, there was also a great deal of controversy about the Vietnam War, our participation in the Vietnam War itself. And what, what impact did those factors have on you and while you were in country attempting uh, to do your job, and maybe job one was to stay alive. There were issues that transcended themselves from stateside to combat. Mm -hmm. And in July, I met a gentleman by the name of Wallace Terry. He wrote a book called Bloods, The Oral History of the Vietnam War by Black Veterans. And we used to get together in a place called the Hakalu, which meant the House of Blackness. And we would get together and talk and rap. And you can go out, and I'm not putting in a plug for any tapes, but very few people know that Motown out of Detroit made a tape or a CD or a record at that time called Guess Who's Coming Home? And it's a dialogue of veterans talking about mm -hmm. the changes they were going to bring forth to the world when they got back because of what they had experienced and what they had witnessed. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to March of 1983 when Wallace Terry spoke up at UMass to be up at one of his book signing. And uh, he actually remembered me. And he called me by my name, my Swahili name, because in those days we gave up the slave name, mm -hmm. Thomas Belton. And my name was Enrefu, N-R-E-F-U. And African names denote a characteristic wow. of the person you're going to meet. And Enrefu meant tall one. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the fellows that were stateside said, Belton, you always act like you know everybody. And I said, I know this man. And that day, I was vindicated because Wallace recognized me. And not only did he recognize me, but he was doing a speech at the uh, student assembly hall at UMass. And my greatest honor was he called me out by my name and said, I want to introduce you to one of the original bloods from Chu Lai in Vietnam. And my most prized possession is a book that Wallace autographed with a note in it from that time frame. And Wallace has passed on, but I still have that book. And it's just very special to me because Wallace was an individual who captured what really happened in Vietnam for veterans. Okay. And his book, Bloods, was the focus of the movie dead presidents that talked about 
the adjustment period mm -hmm. that veterans had when they came back and how at those times combat fatigue, what they call now PTSD, affected the way you handled things and how you viewed authority. You talked a little bit about the, 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 the racial challenges in Vietnam. And there was a time during, during the, uh, this period here in the country, there was considerable racial strife going on. And in addition to that, uh, there was considerable controversy about the Viet, our participation in the Vietnam War itself. Yes. And so what, how did that impact you while you were in country? And you know, just special brief thoughts on that particular yeah. topic. Being stationed uh, at Langley Air Force Base, right. uh, uh, which is in Virginia, and mm -hmm. there were, you know, lots yeah. of African Americans yeah, there, so yeah, we always yeah. had a chance to talk about those things. But it was, it was a major conflict. I mean, for me, the whole issue of the Vietnam War and, and military service was a major conflict for me. I had really debated going to Canada at one point, um, but I felt strongly about uh, providing military service that I had an obligation to providing. Uh, military service, even though I didn't agree with the Vietnam War. So it was an <coughs> ongoing conflict. I know on Langley Air Force Base, uh, whenever there were uh, protests or activities, it was always a conflict about whether we should participate uh, as military people, um, whether we should remain neutral in that regard. And uh, it, it was tough because okay. we knew brothers and sisters mm -hmm. were uh, dying and being uh, maimed and dismembered um, in a war that a lot of people didn't agree with. Any it final thoughts, trouble. Jane, on that? Topic? Yeah. Um, what, what, another shocking point to me, and, 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 I, and I guess it, it brought a lot of bitterness to me and, and anger that I, I, I still carry today, is on the, on the return. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I returned back to the country, uh, we, we, we went over as individuals. Mm -hmm. And so as we went over as an, as an individual, you come back as an, as an individual, mm -hmm. but in a, in a group, mm -hmm. but as an in, not as a, not as a, a unit. Mm -hmm. But when we got to Oakland uh, on our return, there was all these buses lined upside the airport. Let me cut you off, because we'll, we'll, in the next segment, I'll, I'll ask you to expound on that, okay. that, that particular incident, okay? Mm -hmm. Duty. I joined the Army because I wanted a challenge. Honor. I enlisted to follow in my father's footsteps. Country. For me, it was about patriotism. You answered the call to serve, and a grateful nation honors that service with many veterans' benefits. I decided that it was time to go to college and pursue my career. I was able to buy this house. From education and training to home loans to compensation, these and other veterans' benefits may be available to you. I'll be able to change my career and make more money and provide a better life for my family. I will be coming up on retirement and the VA benefits will play a very important part in my life. Find out more about your eligibility, including how to apply online using e-benefits. I think all veterans should take advantage of their VA benefits. They're there, they're earned, and they're valuable. Don't wait. Apply for your VA benefits today. Now, on this, the second segment, I want to focus on uh, your return, uh, return home and the sort of reception and the reaction of, of, of the country um, to, you, to the service that you provided, uh, particularly those of you who were in country, and, uh, and, and, and what you faced. Now, Gene, you were, you were telling the story about when you arrived in Oakland, California, and the reception you got there on the bus. Uh, going back to the back to the base when you this is right when you returned yeah. from Vietnam. Well, yeah, right? let, me, let, me, let me back it up a little bit, just a little bit. Back. Okay. Um, so a lot of individuals who were scheduled to come home mm -hmm. never got home, and then and then they, it, they didn't get killed in combat. Mm -hmm. um, they were they were a lot of them got hooked up in drugs. Mm -hmm. And I remember one night before I left, me and another guy was coming home together, mm -hmm. and he had been. Messed up. He had been he had been pretty messed up with this drug called binoctals, mm -hmm. and he didn't want to come home because he couldn't get the binoctals back in the states. Mm -hmm. So the night before I before we left, someone hollered grenade. And this individual was so hooked on drugs, he pulled the grenade, and he killed himself mm -hmm. because he didn't want to come back home and face what he had to face as far as drug drug problem drug mm -hmm. problem. 
And that, that was my sin off to go back home. I see. You know, I'd been in combat for a year. And in the last night, I, I see my friend pull, pull a grenade pin on himself and kill himself. Mm -hmm. So as, as I traveled home and I got to Oakland, um, they put us on these buses, like I said, mm -hmm. with, 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 with bars and chicken mash on the windows. Mm -hmm. And the bus driver said, when he, when he said duck, just duck. And when he, as, we got, as, we, as we drove out, drove out to the airport, uh, the, the people began to throw in beer cans and, and water balloons and saying foul language and throwing mm -hmm. bottles, cans with, with, with urine in them. Mm -hmm. Just throwing them at, at the bus, at the windows. Yeah. So the bus driver says, that's, what I, that's why I said duck. Mm -hmm. And that went on from the, from the airport to the Oakland Army base. And as we got closer to the base, you can see people with lying outside the base, the base gate with, with signs, calling us baby killers, um, go back to where you've been, you, you know. And, and I'm saying, what's going on here? I mean, we mm -hmm. just come from the war. We didn't ask to go there. We, I, I didn't kill nobody's babies. Mm -hmm. But that was the, um, the tune of what, what we had to come back to. Mm -hmm. Individuals, and we came back as individuals. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I left Oakland, uh, leaving the base, they told us, you cannot leave the base in uniform. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, why? They said, well, uh, we, we just don't want you to. Mm -hmm. I'm always a trailblazer. Mm -hmm. I left the base with my uniform on. Mm -hmm. And I got, before I could leave, get to the airport on my own in a cab, I was, I was, I was assaulted three times. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm still going to take my uniform off. I'm not going to take it off. I got, finally got on my flight, and I came and I got, I went to Washington, D.C. And in Washington, D.C., it was the same thing. They knew our routes of travel. And the protests, wherever we went, they were there. I flew from Washington to Bradley. Um, there was no protesters. Mm -hmm. I felt like I, I said, I'm home. Mm -hmm. There was no protest, but there was no one else there neither. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I got on a bus, came back um, to downtown Springfield at Peter Pan. As a matter of fact, the bus station was right up on the corner at the time, mm -hmm. up on the corner of Columbus Avenue. And I walked from the bus station to my home, which is down in North Thing, with the bus, my duffel bag over my shoulders. Not one person blew the horn or said nothing at all. Mm -hmm. but that's how noticeable we were when we came back home. Mm -hmm. Whereas the day when these soldiers, and when they come back from war now, they come back in units, mm -hmm. they, go, they go in units and they come back in units. Mm -hmm. And they're, group, they're greeted with parades and medals and all kinds of good things. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like we were cheated and, and, and we, we were cheated of that good feeling. Mm -hmm. And, and because of that, it, it, make, it makes our, 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 our dealing with our PTSD mm -hmm. that much more difficult. Mm -hmm. and, and like I said, physically, we may, be, we may look good physically mm -hmm. on the outside, mm -hmm. other, than, other, than, other than canes and a little limp here and there, mm -hmm. but mentally, yeah. we, we, have, we have a lot of issues. Right. We have a lot of issues. And stuff like this, programs like this, it helps help us deal with that because mm -hmm. we get to talk about it. Right. We get to talk about it. What about uh, Milton? Your experiences? Um, I mean, I was here. Uh, I was I was in uh, into '71, so uh, that covered a, you know the later span of the Vietnam War. But it was always distressing to me uh, to see our military people come back and being treated the way they were. Now, in my own mind. I was not happy with the decisions that the government was making. Um, but as a military person, I knew that military people go where they're sent, period. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the nature of the military. So I had no angst with any military people. I had a lot of angst with the government um, in terms of the decisions that they made and where they were sending our young men and how they were sending our men. And I think Tom hit on a very important issue earlier in terms of that 100,000. Um, and uh, so it was, it was really tough because even, even on the street, there was a lot of uh, dissension and uh, difference about the Vietnam War. Was it what, right? Was it wrong? Um, what did these you know, ladies and men do? What did they not do? Um, all of those kinds of things. So it was it was a stressful time, um, uh, even for someone like me who had not uh, had direct participation uh, in the war itself. 